A nome del Comitato di Festival Letteratura ringraziamo il gruppo TEA per aver contribuito alla realizzazione di questo evento. A mettere gli accenti al posto giusto, Marta Bacigalupo e Silvia Andreoli. Welcome back. Welcome back to Accenti. Good evening. And uh, so, in the last uh, 20 years, David Sedaris has made us laugh with his essays. Hopefully, in the next 30 minutes, he won't make our poor interviewer Luca Pareschi cry. <laughs> David Sedaris' accent begins right now. So, thank you, David, for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I did an interview last night, but it was, uh, you know, there was an interpreter, and that just takes forever. <laughs> so this will be a lot quicker. So I'm very excited, but also nervous to interview you. So first thing, I shake your hand, because once you said that you do that to people at your reading. So that way, if you need people's forgiveness during or after the show, they'll give it to you because they feel they know you. So maybe I will ask for your forgiveness. But the real question is, I feel that while you do not pay much attention to online reviews or comments, you're interested in the reaction of the audience at live events. Is that right? Yeah, no, I never read any reviews or online comments. I don't care. I mean, I don't... I mean, you came here, you showed up, so we meet each other halfway. You know what I mean? If somebody stands up and says, you're boring, I'll, I'll listen to you. But if you aren't here and you write it on your phone in your bedroom, I don't care. So, I, yeah, I guess I just don't have a time to... People write me letters and I answer them. You know, but I'm not going to... No, I don't, it doesn't interest me. Thank you. And my understanding is that in your essays, you start from small stories, and you are able to transform them into something that illuminates the lateral way or a different way of looking at things, such as a mummified head or the skeleton of a pygmy in order to show the, the feeling of someone who is able to, to look straight into yourself. So, is there any item or thing that you felt writing about, but you were not satisfied with the result? Oh, sure, that happens all the time. I try to write about something and it doesn't work, and then I'll just set it aside, and maybe a year from now or two years from now it'll work. Um, Hugh and I, we live in the country. Hugh is my boyfriend, and we live in the country in England. And a shepherd asked if he could keep his rams in the pasture behind our house. And so we have these rams that are back there, and they're really mean. Um, <laughs> and they'll charge you if you go into the pasture, and they'll headbutt you, and they're just assholes. They just really are. So I tried earlier to write something about the rams, and, and it wouldn't work, wouldn't work, wouldn't work. And then this summer, something happened with the rams, And I think, I think this time it worked. But I wrote it, and then I'll read it out loud on stage in America in a few weeks, so I'll see. But I think I found a way to write about it that people can uh, relate to, I think. So, Hopefully. thank you. And um, what about your outsider look? Like, people write that uh, your look as an outsider, living in France, living in Britain, is something which is useful for you to, to write that kind of stories, that kind of essays that you write. But do you still have to train that side after so many years writing, or it's just a natural thing? Well, where, uh, I was born in New York State, in the United States, and then when I was a, a young boy, my family moved to the South. And back then, the South, where we lived, It was very, everybody was from the South. And you would get beat up at school because you were from the North. And um, people could tell by your accent you didn't belong. So I kind of grew up behind enemy lines. So I was used to it. And then when I moved to France, 
you know, when you're a foreigner, a lot of times you don't you don't count. You know, where people treat you like uh, you're not. You know, you're human, but you're not really human. You know. And so in France, I got treated like that a lot. And then in England, I get treated like that. But I actually like being treated like that. Um, because it's like somebody's handing me money. You know, it's something I can write about. Uh, Hugh and I have been spending a lot of time in Japan. You know, where you're really... You, it's very clear by your look that you're an outsider. Um, Japanese people, on the one hand, are so incredibly polite, but on the other hand, if you get on the subway and you take a seat, people will get up and move away from you, you know, because they, sell, they say that you smell like butter. <laughs> <laughs> Which to me is a good thing to smell like, but, but I love that too. And if I want to be treated... You, you know, I go back to the United States and I go on these long tours across the country so that I can be at home then. But I don't need to be like that all the time. I like... I like... Also, when you live in another country, nothing's your fault. Right? <laughs> so when, bad, when Boris Johnson, right, was Prime Minister of England, it wasn't my fault. I'm not allowed... <laughs> I'm not allowed to vote there, right? But in America, when Donald Trump is president, that's my fault, right? Actually, it's Hugh's fault because my boyfriend Hugh was alone on an elevator with Donald Trump once, and he didn't kill him. So every day when Donald Trump was president and he would do something horrible, I would say to Hugh, this is your fault. I mean, even if you went to prison for the rest of your life, you kind of owe it to the world <laughs> to kill someone. You don't, want to, you don't want to kill a lot of people, but I mean, that was a case where he should have. <laughs> uh, going on this uh, train of thought, in an interview you said, when I was younger, I wrote stories that you might tell if someone didn't know you and you wanted to give them a general idea of who you were. Now it's more of an exercise of making something out of nothing, which doesn't bother me. Can you tell us something more about how you make something out of nothing? Uh, well, gosh, I mean, I keep a diary every day and I've been doing it for a long time. Like today, I had an interview with this young woman and she said, would you rather, let's say, kill a homeless person, right? And no one would ever know you did it. Or would you rather have everyone in the world think that you did something you didn't do? And it's such a good question. Right? What do you do if those are your choices? And I said I would kill the homeless person. You know what I mean? I'd find a mean one, you know, and <laughs> kill him rather than have people think that I did something that I didn't do. Um, but maybe a, an essay could come out of that, you know? I mean, that's the sort of a thing that you could, you could attach that to something right and 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 write an entire essay perhaps about it but i just keep a notebook in my pocket and i just write everything down and then in the morning i write it down and then every now and then there's something that happens and i think oh maybe that would work as a you know as its own Essay. So, I mean, that's all I do is I just pay attention to things and I'm always looking. And, you know, sure, stuff gets by me, but... Uh, gosh, woman... Oh! Uh, make the lemonade. Oh. Uh, anyway, I was just looking at my notebook here for something that I thought would 
maybe work as an essay, but I'm not, this is a brand new notebook, so I'm not seeing, huh, so many things in here yet, but anyway, I just, can't you shoot her, huh, <laughs> what was that about, uh, <laughs> Huh. Oh, I've been watching this TV show in England. There's this show called Love on the Spectrum, right? And it's a television show that comes out of Australia, and it's people who are autistic, and there's, it's a dating show for people who are autistic. But I think that the people are talked into going on dates. Like somebody said, you need to be in love with somebody, and you need to have a partner I don't think they really care. And so they go on dates, and they can't think of anything to say to each other, right? And then at the end, they kind of wander away from each other like cattle. You know, like... But then there's a new show, and it's a dating show for people with Down syndrome. And they fall in love, and right in, 10 minutes into their first date, they're talking about having babies and being together forever, and it's such a better show. Um, it, it's the happiest television show ever. It's called Down With Love, if you get a chance to watch it. And so I think there's something there. And why are there all these dating shows about people who are developmentally disabled? Why? Why? I'd, it's, a, it's a trend. But I, do you have shows like that in Italy? No, I don't think so. As long as I, as I know, we don't have anything like huh. that. I don't know if the audience agrees, but I don't think we have something huh. serious. Not yet. Hmm. <laughs> um, what do you find interesting about people now that you, at 66, say that you hate everyone? <laughs> Is there still something you find interesting in people? Or? Oh, no, I hate everybody... Uh, in America, <laughs> no, I feel like the far right is just as bad as the far left in America. So there I hate everybody. Like I hate, yeah, all, both the extremes I, I hate. But oh. not regular people. You know, like if I, I don't hate the woman at the grocery store, I don't hate the pilot on my plane, you know, I just... You know, it's like when you listen to the news or you read the newspaper, it's like, I hate everyone. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, this make, gives me the occasion to skip to a following question because I wanted to ask you that in current times, the, let's say, increased social sensitivities to certain themes or the way you speak about those uh, impacted the works of several authors. Did you get... Did you find a difference in the way you write or work? Did you, do you pay more attention to the possibility of triggering a reaction for someone who feels offended by what you write? Usually the things that people are offended by is not anything that you would expect, right? I got a letter recently from this woman, and when I was 14 years old, my mother made us get volunteer jobs. I don't know if those are big in Italy. Like, they're not big in France. In France, the government really pays people to do everything. But in England and America, volunteer work is a big thing. And in England, you retire from your regular job and you volunteer somewhere, right? So when I was 14, my mother made me volunteer, so I went to a psychiatric hospital, and I volunteered there. And on my first day, I was sent into a locked ward, and I had to help strap a naked 85-year-old woman to a table. And I was talking about it on stage, and I said that if you, I believe if you're gay, you're born that way, right? But if you want to kind of steer a child in that direction, you know, you might see to it that the first vagina he sees is on an 85-year-old woman, right? And, 
um, a woman wrote to me, and she was furious, and she called me ageist and sexist. But it is simply true. If you're 14, you want to see the vagina of another 14-year-old. Do you know what I mean? Like, not your grandmother's. That's not what you want. That's just true. And she said, how would you like it if I said, oh, if you want to make your daughter a lesbian, make sure the first penis she sees is on an 85-year-old man? And I said, fine. I said, lower it to 60. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't care. But so... If you would ask me at the end of that night, what's somebody going to be mad about? I wouldn't even have guessed that they were going to be angry about that. So that happens a lot. Or you say, usually it's something like that. It's just something that, oh, my sister, I wrote that my, one of my sisters had a, um, uh, a turtle, right? a tortoise, and she had it in a pen in her yard. And raccoons broke into the pen and chewed the front legs off of her tortoise. But the tortoise lived, but it didn't have any front legs. So she was feeding her tortoise crickets, and she tore the legs off a cricket and threw it to her turtle to make it slower so the turtle could get it. And somebody wrote to me, furious, how dare you? You know, you think insects have no feelings, and you think it's funny to tear legs off a cricket. And I didn't even do it. It was my sister. <laughs> it was my sister who did it. And she did it because her turtle was handicapped, OK? <laughs> so that's the kind of things that people get upset over. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I just think it's funny, really. <laughs> but if, if I went to somebody else's reading, if I went to a reading and somebody said, uh, I think that gay people are, are less intelligent and more selfish and that gay people are really the cause of every problem in society today, I wouldn't care. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I don't care. I don't care about... I don't get offended by things. I don't take it personally. I don't... I don't so I don't... Uh, and I'm sure not going to write a letter because somebody took legs off a cricket. <laughs> because you know what? All right, if you, look at the, if you look at the human race, right, and you say a certain percentage of humans are assholes, right? Then aren't a certain percentage of crickets assholes? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so maybe the cricket she took the legs off of was an asshole. <laughs> like, did you ever think of that? <laughs> so I really have to ask this. Moving to a different kind of animal, uh, my brother is really into owls. He likes to collect several things related to owls and he's filling up the house and the room with uh, old theme statues and the like. Mm. So I really wanted to ask you if you eventually get rid of any issue of your collection of owls related things. Oh, you know how that is. If you tell people that you, if you have one owl, right? Or you know like sometimes somebody will have a cat and then someone says, oh, here's a cat coffee mug. Here's a cat bath towel. And then before you know it, your whole house is filled with cat stuff, but you didn't even really want it. And so that happened with me with owls. And people gave me all this owl stuff. And so, because I wrote about, we have a taxidermied owl. And that was enough. And then I'm telling you, people gave me Oh, dinner plates with owls and soap that had owls on it. And uh, no, I got rid of all of it. Everything. And even, you know what? The thing about taxidermy is that moths will destroy it. So we don't even have the owl anymore. <laughs> None of it. Oh, thank you. Um, going back to something maybe more serious. Oh, so I, there is another thing that I really wanted to ask you. So... I spent a lot of the summer reading and rereading your essays, your books, and I ended up during a very tense period at work asking myself whether 
you would have found something funny in the situation I was living, uh, so as to at least live through the moment. So what I was wondering is whether this is the way humor works, like you give people possibility to see things from a different, easier way, or am I just crazy after reading everything that you wrote? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I, I mean, it's the things that make me laugh sometimes, it's just a word choice or... A, I was reading this book the other day, Alexander Heman. Do you know who he is? He's Bosnian writer, and he moved to Chicago, and he... And in no time at all, he didn't speak any English. He started writing in English. And he's really a, a genius, Alexander Heman, H-E-M-O-N. But he was, I was reading a collection of short stories, and he was talking about somebody, and he said, she never blinked unless she was blinking when I blinked. <laughs> and that <laughs> was so funny to me. <laughs> that was just the funniest thing I'd read in so long. I just, and I could relate to it just because it's a kind of a thing that would go through your mind, right? And I think that must happen a lot, that people blink when we blink. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, probably just crazy. Um, so uh, another thing, after all of the years and your experiences writing about family, writing about also the death of your sister uh, and the death of your father, I wanted to ask you at the moment, what is your take about the reaction of family and friends regarding them being uh, characters in your essays? Well, I always ask somebody first, you know, and I give it to them to read. And then I say, if there's anything you want me to change or get rid of, you know, I will do it. Uh, one of my sisters just said she doesn't want me to write about her anymore. And so now I'm just waiting until she dies. <laughs> and I think the sooner she does die, the better. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, it's time for her to die. And seriously, if it is possible, um, have you ever thought that you would have liked to change something that you wrote in some of your previous essays? Or oh yeah, no, definitely. Um, but main, the main thing I would change was when I first moved to Paris, I, had a, I went to French school, and my teacher was so mean. But I guess I didn't realize that she was just, like a lot of French teachers, I think, are like that, right? And she stabbed a girl in the eye with a pencil one day and said, wake up or go back to Seoul, you know, go back to Korea. She didn't mean to do it. She just jabbed, and it caught the girl in the eye. And she would mock you and get up in your face. And I wrote about it, and then the teacher was really hurt by it. But if I had it to do over again, I would mention that we, we really loved her. Even though she was really mean, she, she taught us so much. I, and I went to Japan later, and I went to Japanese school. But the teachers never wanted to hurt your feelings, so they would never correct you. So you never knew when you were making a mistake. So I learned much better with a mean teacher. So I'm really grateful to my French teacher. And I don't know, I would like, it's never too late. I could write a new essay about her, I suppose. But I, I think about that a lot. I, I, uh, it would have been a much better essay if I had included the fact that we adored her. Thank you. Uh, completely different topic. How is it going, the street cleaning process around your, your home in, in UK? Did you find any ally beyond being honored by you know, the queen? I walked in that park today that's around Mantua, you know, the park. I did not find any rubbish if this was England, it would have been covered with cans and bottles and papers. And we drove here from Milan the other day. I didn't see rubbish on the side of the road. It's so clean here compared to England. Uh, and where I live in England, people just, they throw everything out the window of their car. And the land is so beautiful, and it just drives me crazy. And so I spend... 
you know, four to six hours a day cleaning up rubbish on the side of the road. And I cleaned up so much, I was invited to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> the queen has one day a year when she would invite, like, do-gooders to Buckingham Palace. And so I was invited just because of that. Um, and so it's, I guess it's my hobby. And I... <laughs> I'd try not to think about it too hard. I don't think about people who... But where I live, like, you'll get a new mattress, say, and you take your old one and you just throw it on the side of a road in the country. You get a new refrigerator, you take your old one, you take it in the woods and you dump it in the woods. It's so... I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand why anybody would do that. I don't... I saw this girl in London last week. She was like 25, and she was eating these uh, crispy mushrooms. It was like potato chips, but mushrooms. And, and then when she finished the bag, she went out into the street, and somebody had thrown a paper bag down into the street, and she put her plastic bag on top of the paper one. <laughs> and that's just putting trash on top of trash. That's not, not littering. I just don't understand that. She could have put it in her pocketbook. She could have, you know, waited until she found the trash can. I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. So I see that we are moving toward the, the end of our half an hour. So I wanted to ask you, yeah, I don't know, it's supposed to be 26 at the moment, but uh, the hourglass will probably reach the, the, the timer. What I wanted to ask you, if you can just say, tell us something about any funny experience that you had in Mantova in these days or in your previous festival literatura. Well, the best one, I just did interviews all day, but that young woman who I met today, she was a young journalist, and her questions were so surprising to me, but she was the one who said, would I rather, you know commit a crime that no one would know about or have people think. And then her other question was, would I rather be in prison for five years or be in a coma for ten years? <laughs> but whenever you watch TV, somebody wakes up from a coma and they're like, what happened? But in real life, when you wake up from a coma, you're a vegetable for the rest of your life. So I'd rather go to prison. Because if you went to prison, you'd definitely get a book out of it. <laughs> right? And plus, if you're old in prison, no one's going to, like, you can drop all the soap in the shower you want. No one's going to, <laughs> no one's going to, you know, rape you because you're too old. <laughs> um. You write a lot about you learning other languages, uh, you, and you also told us about that. Do you ever take the chance of reading your books translated in other languages, and what do you feel about that? Well, I'm tr really trying to learn German, and so I go t the day after tomorrow for my German book tour, and I just thought, why I should read my book in German, because I wrote it. <laughs> and so I could, I don't know, it would be a... It would be a good first book to read in German. Hugh reads in French. Hugh was today was reading a book in French. I never read a book in French. It just seemed... I don't like the way they make the quotation marks. <laughs> it just looks ugly to me, so I never read in French. So the very last thing regarding COVID-19, you wrote or said somewhere that a million Americans died in the pandemic, but you didn't get to choose a single one of them. And which is something interesting and strong to be, to be said. And there was some polemic after that. Um, can we learn something about humor works uh, from this uh, sentence and the way it was received? Well, I think a lot of people felt that way. Like in America, over a million people died of COVID. And it just doesn't seem fair that I didn't get to choose any of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what if they said to everybody, you get to choose one person who's going to die of this disease. <laughs> and then, let's say if one person got a lot of votes, you know, maybe they would, 
<laughs> have been one of the ones to die. It would just be interesting. I mean, a lot of really good people died. And it just seemed unfair to me that good people, a lot of good people died. Well, why didn't Donald Trump die of COVID? Do you know what I mean? Like, how is that fair that the playwright Terrence McNally died, who was a lovely person and brought the world so much? Why did he die and not Mitch McConnell, right? It just doesn't make sense. But I guess that's why people have religion. Because things happen and they don't make sense. And religion helps, I don't know, calm people down or religion says to people, it'll all be revealed later, you know, so. <laughs> so our hourglass is over and I thank you a lot. Uh, oh gosh, thank you for preparing and reading the book and that means so much to me. That was a lot of work on your part. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know if to be... <laughs> Honestly, it was really a pleasure. It's not always like that to prepare interviews. So thank you very much for your books. <laughs>